Hey, Conan O'Brien here. Welcome to Serious Jibber Jabber. I'm sitting here with the author of 11 New York Times bestsellers. Most notable among them are Liar's Poker, Moneyball, and The Blind Side. His latest, Flash Boys, uncovers some of the unsightly ways that the stock market actually works. Very happy to be joined by Michael Lewis. Michael, thanks for doing this. Thanks for having me. Uh, read the book, and I'm gonna be completely honest with you, love the book. Sections, and I mentioned this to you before, there are sections that I didn't understand what I was reading. I, I am- <laughs> I, I worry. I'm terribly because... wired, I'm terribly <laughs> wired for, for finance. The world of financial transactions, especially when we're parsing it down to milliseconds on computers, sometimes escapes me, but it was still a fascinating ride. So parts of it, were I think the most complicated things I had to ever write. And the, the reason I had to explain them is that Wall Street has made itself so complicated intentionally so you do not understand it because your understanding is something that can be, your misunderstanding is something that can be exploited. To me, there was like this technical detail that I had to bring across to the reader just to satisfy people who had that degree of curiosity. Yep. But there was really a pretty simple story. And the simple story was, guy who works on Wall Street who's a trader, a prof runs the trading desk at the Royal Bank of Canada, discovers around 2008 that he's a, he, he's someone, there's some predator out there who's, who's an, who knows what he wants to do in the market before he does it and is ex sort of exploiting him. And he discovers that it isn't just him and that sort of anybody who's an investor is on the receiving end of this predatory activity. He figures out what they're doing, explains it, goes and explains it to other people who are prey, and then he goes out to try to destroy the predator. So it's, a, it's one part like detective story, figuring out what happened, and one part kind of revenge story. Let's, let's get the bad guys. Um, so it's, a, it's got a, a slight uh, elements of like the untouchables. Let's get a ragtag group of people together to fight the bad guys. Yeah, I thought I was thinking of the dirty dozen. Right. Yeah, or actually what I thought, what I was thinking. I think everyone gets killed in the Dirty Dozen. <laughs> <laughs> I think this, is, this one isn't over yet. Yeah. yeah exactly. Everyone may get killed in this yeah, one Yeah, you too. gotta be careful. Yeah, you gotta yeah. Be, so uh, it was interesting. So this guy, his name's Brad Katsuyama. He's Canadian. One of the things that is curious about this ragtag group of people is almost none of them are American. They're all mostly immigrants. Yeah. And, and most of them had some idea about how this society was supposed to work and it was supposed to be fair in certain ways. And they, they were, for whatever reason, slower to buy into the idea that just because you work in the financial se sector, you have to sort of behave the way a lot of people who work in the financial sector behave. They, 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 they saw this thing that was clearly not good, they, and they set about trying to fix it rather than exploit it. I mean, and, and to me, what interested me in telling the story was almost just that. It was like, why do some people if you see a like a, like you see a, a big oil pipe carrying oil from one side of the country to the other, and it has, and someone comes and whacks a hole in it, and it makes a fortune out of the oil coming out of the hole, and a whole like ecosystem grows up around this pilfered oil. Uh, why does somebody walk into that situation and say, "Let's fix the hole in the pipe," as Rather opposed than just to get out their own yeah, and, and, and take some oil? It. And then, so that's what happened effectively. A, pi a pipe got busted in the financials in the stock market. An ecosystem grew up around it to exploit the busted pipe. Um, it was without anybody making the slightest effort to fix the pipe. In fact, the, all the effort in the financial system was to preserve the size of the hole, maybe increase the size of the hole. And I just want to be uh, to clarify what's fascinating in this book is, which I did not know, is that people were exploiting the speed at which trades were made electronically. Right. So. Should I say it? Because you might confuse people. Yes. That's the nicest thing anyone's ever said to me. No, so Suddenly I became a grandfather who's not allowed to drive the car. <laughs> and you take it, Michael. Yes, I'll, I can't anymore. I'll just, yeah, go I, ahead. I'll probably confuse yeah. people too, because it is a little confusing. Um, the, the, there are 13 stock exchanges now in this country, not just one, not just the New York Stock mm -hmm. Exchange. So you might buy or sell like AT&T on 13 different places. And these stock exchanges now sell to insiders, to, to high frequency traders, the right to put their computer right next to the exchange and get information about what's happening on the exchange before everybody else. So they know when prices move before everybody else. So it's sort of like some people have a few millisecond advantage in finding out what prices are. Right. Those same people go to the brokers that you give your stock market order to, whether it's E-Trade or Ameritrade, one of the online people, or whether it's JP Morgan or Merrill Lynch or whoever, and they buy the right to trade against your trade, your slow-moving trade. Mm 
Yep. So they may know the stock's gone down or up. If it's, they will know if it's moved at all and you don't, and they have the right to trade against you. So it's a constant opportunity to exploit the slowness with which you're, you're getting information. Or another way to look at it is, it's a constant opportunity to exploit the informational value of what you're trying to do. And this is what happened to this guy, the main guy, the hero of the book. He was a Wall Street guy. I mean, he was trading hundreds of millions of dollars of stock, but he would go to, the, his trading screens would say, there are 20,000 shares of Microsoft available at $20 a share. And he'd say, okay, I wanna buy them. And he'd hit his button. And one day he hits his button and all of a sudden, the minute he tries to buy them, they go away and the, the stock goes up. And it's, like, it's because the traders could see what he wanted to do and they did it in front of him. So it's, it's like this built-in, it was so, it's so, I don't know, it's not sinister, it's more, it's sort of like persistent about the problem, is that it's this built-in skim of pennies on every transaction. So you don't really feel it. I mean, you, you lost a penny, who cares, you lost a penny. But when you add it up over the whole market, it's billions and billions of year of basically grift. Uh, and nobody says anything. I mean, it's just obviously wrong. It's obviously, the only point of this, this skim is to benefit well, the guys who are having to be inside the exchanges and the, the financial sector as a whole at the expense of the broader economy. And you would think that someone would say, really, this shouldn't be going on. I mean, you would think that. And it took, it took these guys, I thought, so what interested me was- yeah, What's interesting is they're, they're not, <clears throat> there's uh, an Irish immigrant, there's a, there's a Canadian. It did take people from- Outside. Outside, which makes you, when you read the book, question, do we, are we not teaching ethics in this country anymore? Uh, are other countries, or, or are there other systems where people might be more inclined to feel ethically than they would if you- This is a really great question. I think, you, I think it's a really great question, because you go, I think what, what's happened is the, the people who are sitting in the middle of this system and making money from it, they're the brightest graduates of, of the best schools in the country, who've basically taken in the idea that it, if you make a lot of money, you're a success. And it's not that what they're doing is illegal. I don't think anybody actually broke any laws. They took advantage of a, a, a mistake in the system, a glitch in the system, rather than fix the system. Um, that the, 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 the success, that the feelings of success that came with the making of the money completely overwhelmed the sense that, wow, this is, this is actually not good what's going on. Um, and the, the, the basic, like a, it's like a basic moral sense is numbed in a lot of people. And I think that right. this is true when you become part of systems. I mean, you, you, it's just, it's the culture of, the, of Wall Street. And this guy, Brad Katsuyama, who sort of leads this charge, I mean, he gets moved from Canada to the, to, to the United States. And as the more he's exposed to the American way of finance, the more insane he becomes. I mean, the more upset he becomes. He just he is, he has almost a physiological re reaction to it. his blood pressure starts going up, he can't sleep at night and so on and so forth. He actually, it violated his moral sense, what was going on. Right. And it's odd, you know, it, that makes it all sound very pious and humorless and all the rest. It's, it's not that he is a pious person, not at all. It's like a regular guy, uh, kind of a good guy. He just, he didn't care enough about the money to violate his own moral sense to get it. And uh, so I do think it's a question worth, worth asking. It's like, why, why aren't more people who were big successes on Wall Street more concerned with like just making it work well for everybody as opposed to just get dollars? And this goes to a bigger theme that you write about, which is access to information. That, that in, we think of ourselves in America as having this democratic fair system or trying to be fair, mm -hmm. as fair as possible. We like to think that our markets are fair. We like to think that it's the land of opportunity, that if you have a talent, you can rise to the top. And what's becoming increasingly clear and what you've written about in your books is that people with access to some information have an advantage. And the technology now exists where certain people can have access to certain information and it gives them a big advantage over other people. It's not a fair market. That's exactly right. It's a, it is, I think if you read the story, it's hard to conclude anything but the market is rigged. It's rigged in a way that, you know, you can, investors can still make money in the market and so on and so forth, but there are, there are players in the marketplace who have such a systematic advantage that they'll go a thousand days of trading stocks without ever losing money uh, because it's just, they have. Right. A, it's, it's a totally, un, it's the, and the advantage comes from basically where you sit in the world. And if you happen to sit on the inside of the financial system, you have this advantage. And it is, that's probably always been true. I mean, I'm sure it's always been true that the people who are inside the financial system have an advantage over everybody else and the, the game is to get there. Um, 
but it is, it is a little, I think it is a little metaphor for the culture that it's sort of like all dollars in the marketplace don't stand the same chance. That some, do, some people's dollars have, have advantages, unfair advantages over other people's dollars. Well, probably the biggest issue in the country right now that's a that's a pretty heavy statement, but uh, yeah, I will say that one of the biggest issues is is income inequality, disappearing middle class. Right. We have this layer of incredibly wealthy people, uh, a smaller middle class that's shrinking, and then we have a lot of people that uh, have inadequate incomes. And uh, then the question is, why is this broadening? Why is this getting bigger? Why is this income inequality so. seem to be growing and growing and growing? It's obviously a complicated question, yes, right? Yeah. So let's just accept it's a complicated question that yes. has to do with globalization of markets, right. probably. Right. Um, but given that, given that there are these trends that, sh and you can feel it, right? You can feel like the gaps between rich and everybody else just feel very, they feel like they're growing. Mm -hmm. And you don't need, you don't even need the statistics to see. You see it in the, you see yeah. it in life. Some people fly on jets and some people flying don't fly. Right. <laughs> uh, and, and the, the um, but given that, given that this is happening, it seems insane to me that we allow the financial sector, which is. Which is supposed to be pure. At least there's, it's supposed to, you would think in theory, it's supposed Especially to be the stock market. It's like the it's most supposed to be a regulated, level yeah. democratized mark, financial market in the world. It's supposed to be a level, level playing field. Um, it seems crazy that you structure these markets to make the rich richer at everybody else's expense. When I was explaining, like my kids ask me, what, they're vaguely interested in whatever book I'm writing, not terribly, but sometimes they'll say like, what's the book about? And I said, well, this is a, it's actually a very weird story. I said, these guys on Wall Street who are really rich have figured out how to take pennies away from everybody else who isn't very rich, aren't very rich, and it adds up to billions of dollars. And they say, rich people steal money from other people? I said, well, it's, stealing is not, ex it's not exactly what's going on, but it's pretty close. They go, that's awful. It is awful. And some guy saw it was awful, and he came in and he decided to take it back. It's, right. And they said, it's Robin Hood. That is basically the story. It's the story of Robin Hood. But it does seem crazy that as a matter of public policy, we do not try to cut off these gambits by the well-to-do insiders to, to take advantage of people who are not. Right. Uh, because there are all these other forces at work that are already widening gaps. I mean, why, why like, have a market that's contributing to this? You know, it's, uh, you can't talk about this and not think about the mortgage-backed securities fiasco we had a couple of years ago, uh, which is, we're still feeling the effects of that right. and how it's clear to me that many people in this country knew that this wasn't sustainable, knew that this was toxic, but just kept the ball rolling. Going back to the question of ethics, that there were a lot of people working in the system who understood this is gonna blow at some point. We, this, That's true. And, and then there was a national outcry afterwards. There's been a crime obviously committed, terrible errors have been made, People have to pay for it, and there's a sense that nothing happened. There was no, you know, there was no trial. There was no, no one, it, it felt like no one paid the price. No one went to jail. Nobody. I think the political, I think, I think what basically what happened was, all right, so we have this, I mean, basically, maybe the worst, the most spectacular financial crisis in, in our history, generated really by by machinations on Wall Street to disguise the risk of lending money to people who never pay it back. Yeah. And that happens, and what naturally usually follows a financial crisis is a depression. And the Federal Reserve is, has been really good at numbing the pain. And in numbing the economic pain, they sort of reduce the political will to make changes. I think that's what happened. Uh, so that the anger went out of it as it became clear that this was gonna be a protracted recession as opposed to depression, whatever. But. Um, and the, the strategy of the government was, and it may not have been a bad strategy, it was sort of like, well, in order to like, make sure we don't have a depression, we've got to prop up these existing banks that all would fail if we didn't prop them up and, and resuscitate them. But in resuscitating them, they also resuscitated their political power, so they had, their money had a, lot of, had yeah. a lot of influence on what, how they're regulated. And it's all outrageous, and it's all unfair, and you have this, this giant-like sector in the economy the financial sector, or at least the big banks, the big banks, that are essentially kind of like removed from the rest of the society. And it, 
most people are exposed to market forces. Like, if you fail, you fail. Um, if you are a trader on Wall Street, it's not quite as simple as that. That you get to keep your winnings, uh, someone else gets stuck with your losses kind of thing. There's a bit of that going on. Um, and it is, I mean, it, I think that to some extent, the response to this book has been like unslaked anger about about the, the outcomes of the, after the financial crisis. Because it just like violated the basic rules of the system. Like you can't have the richest people in the society living by one set of rules where they don't have to, fa they never fail. No matter how badly they do their job, they don't fail. And then everybody else living by like red and tooth and claw capitalism. Um, so I think that, that it, it, there is an unsettled quality to the relationship between Wall Street, the financial sector, and everybody else. Um, and what's interesting to me about this particular episode, this story that I've written, one of the things, is that these guys who raise their hand and say there's a broken pipe, we need to fix this system, uh, they're like trying to repair the relationship. They're what they're trying to do is introduce trust back on Wall Street. Well, they build, they, they come up with a, a software program. They come for, up with an exchange to, yeah. they build their own stock exchange right. on which the predator can't function. And the way they do it is they, they essentially coil like 60 kilometers or 60, 30 miles or whatever, it's 38 miles of fiber between themselves and the, the predator's machines. So the predators, they're essentially ban it, effectively put far, far away from the activity. So they, can, they may know things that everybody else doesn't know in the marketplace, but they can't react to it on the exchange. So they level, they re-level the playing field. But the point of re-leveling the playing field, it's not just like to make the stock market fair. That's, I, you know, that's, the, that's the narrow goal, but the broader goal is like, to create an environment where people actually deserve to be trusted. Like the people who are sitting in the middle of the system are actually trustworthy. And when you do that, it's really seditious. I mean, investors, the way I got onto this story is big investors told me, this guy from Wall Street, Brad Katsuyama, just walked into my office and told me the truth about how the stock market worked and my jaw's on the floor. But more to the point, this, my jaw's on the floor partly because I can't believe how it works, but my jaw's on the floor because I can't believe some guy from Wall Street actually told me the truth. Yeah. And th there's no trust in the system. It's, a, it's like, uh, it's bankrupt that way. So someone has to come along and restore the trust because you can't, it doesn't really function very well without the trust. And that's his, I think that's his role in the world. And I, it's been a success. It, uh, his the, exchange? His exchange. They're making, they're already profitable. But it's hard to know how, they could be, they're still a bug. They could be squashed. They, they're less than 1% of the stock market right now. It, it, you can imagine lots of different outcomes. It's not clear that they're gonna and win. And clearly there's a lot of people that aren't rooting for Brad and his exchange. They're All, the entire existing financial system is, root, is not rooting for Brad and his exchange, just about. There are a few exceptions. It's a little more complicated than that, but basically, all the obviously the existing exchanges and most of the brokers don't want him to succeed because he sucks money out of the system, yeah. right? Yeah. So I mean, the net effect of him, if he were, if they end up overrunning the stock market and they become the stock market, basically, like people on Wall Street make ten billion dollars less a year or something like right. that. Right. Right. So that's not that doesn't you know it's that's not that's set up for he's set up for lots of conflict with with people on Wall Street. He's had people tell him they're gonna come beat him up and you know, kneecap him and watch out, they're friends with the mafia and he's, they've got, they have many, they've been threatened. Really? Oh yeah, yeah. They, We're still kneecapping people. I don't think they're actually, don't <laughs> be, nobody, <laughs> no one's done it but yet. But you know what actually on Wall Street's funny? There are a lot of almost fights. On Wall, right. They, everybody's, there's a lot of like, I almost hit him. I, right. If he said one more thing, I'd have hit him. Right. And there's a lot of almost. Well, fights. there's a, it's a macho. It's a very macho culture. Yeah, but there's it's a, a very chest thumping culture. But then no one actually. They, everyone has a lawyer. That's, that's exactly it. Everybody's yeah. afraid of getting sued, so they think yeah. I'd have thrown that punch, except that it would have cost me a million bucks. Uh, but there's a so he's in a lot of almost fights. People almost would have hit him. Uh, nothing's actually happened. So, looking at this, the broader issue here, if you look at historically, just at the United States you see that we've been through this many times. We've actually been through periods, there's the, you know, there's the Gilded Age where, mm -hmm. and then there's reform, and then there's a depression, and then there's reform you know, in the 20s. We've been through these periods, uh, there was uh, economic uh, you know, turmoil in the late 80s, and then there was a sense that there's reform. And it seems like we never really learn, because my theory is that human beings, we are always 
we are evolved to try and game the system. True. We, we, it's what we're meant to do. We do it the way we breathe. We will game the system. And it's like it's rain on the roof will eventually get in. Right. And people will game the system. Especially Russians. Yeah, exactly. The, the Russians, it's amazing the role of Russians in all this. It's like the Russians. Why, now, why, why specifically Russians? The Russians, have, I have some Russian immigrants explain it to me. They say that we grew up in a system where you could only survive if you gained the system. Right. There was not enough bread. You had to figure out how to get the bread. Bread was available, but you had to gain the system to get the bread. So when they get to America, it seems like the land of unlimited gaming opportunities. Costco, this I didn't know this, but Costco, they did, apparently Russians discovered that Costco has an incredibly generous returns policy. You can buy something, use it for a year, and th on the 364th day, bring it back. And so there's this, like, it's just like accepted behavior in the New Jersey Russian community that you go and do this. You game the Costco returns policy. Uh, That's but fantastic. It, they, but they have, if you talk to a Russian about what you, can, what you can get away with in America, it's breathtaking. And the Russian, the other side of it is that the Russian has generated a lot of very gifted computer programmers, and that's who is gaming the stock market. So the combination of the predisposition to gaming systems and the experience with it and the coding ability has led them to be very pre prominent in the high-frequency trading business. It's almost like, yeah, they're, they're, again, if you're looking at evolution, they lived in a system where they had to evolve this way, and now they've come to a fresh environment right. where w there's just a lot of fat veal walking around. That's right, yes. Uh, and we have bad eyesight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they have, you know, they're quick and they have yeah. machetes and they're Night going vision to goggles. Ex and night vision goggles, right. yeah. There's, uh, and so, so at the end of the day, isn't it, you know, um, it's in our DNA to try and game the system. So what we need is, it feels to me like we need a strong uh, ethical counterbalance. It almost has to be, I don't even know if they teach ethics in schools anymore, but that's the thing I keep coming back to is there needs to be a counterbalance. There needs to be something that uh, institutes reform more often. Do you know what I mean? That uh, That's what needs to be part of the system, if anything, is that we're always going to be gaming it. There's always going to be some scam going on in Wall Street. Right. So we need to encourage people to do what Brad is doing. So I think... My own view on this, it, without any like evidence, but it's just just like my, me, when I spout on this subject, I think that we're in a particularly toxic climate in the relationship between our elites and everybody else, because in the past, when when it appeared that so much of one's position in the society was inherited. Um, and when it was less of a meritocratic sc a scramble, mm -hmm. when you went to Harvard because your dad went to Harvard as right. opposed to you went to Harvard because you got an 800 on your SATs, there was the idea of noblesse oblige. You know, there the sense that you, you, there was a niggling sense that you, you were basically handed some of this. You didn't actually earn it. So you owe something back, right? And the vice of the meritocracy is that you think, I did this myself. You know, right. I don't know anybody anything. Uh, I'm on top because I got I belong on top. I'm the winner, and so th I think that to the extent there might be ethical evolution in our culture, it's getting back. It's finding a way to reintroduce the idea of noblesse oblige to people who don't understand why they should feel it, and uh, because what we ha I mean the problem the problem that Brad Katsiam is addressing is that is that problem. It's like people on top seeing an opportunity to exploit and make lots and lots of money for themselves, and it doesn't occur to them that that might be a bad thing to do. It just, they just think, oh, that's how I, you know, I got here by, by gaming the system, I got here by being smarter than everybody else, I'm just, this is just more just rewards for me. It, and a kind of, not a terribly organic connection to the rest of the society. Um, so how do you teach? I mean, you say teach ethics in school. And it may be, I mean, business schools all pretend to teach it. That nobody wants to say we're not ethical. And they're always embarrassed when some of their graduates go to jail for various financial manipulations. Right, right. But the real problem is that when, guy, when people get rich doing stuff that's socially uh, destructive, like the subprime mortgage thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people, I mean, a lot of people on Wall Street got really rich doing really bad things with money, that really stupid things that contributed to the financial crisis. And nobody asked them for their money back. And nobody actually thinks that ill of them. They think, oh, this is a rich, successful person. They, they never actually, they, never, they were never on the receiving end in a serious way of any kind of disapproval. That the, their, their, the mere fact they had lots of money 
overwhelmed with whatever it was they did to get the money. Um, so I don't know exactly how you change those attitudes. I think, I mean, you preach, basically. I did yeah. it once. I mean, I, I tried to sneak. I did a commencement speech at Princeton two years ago, mm -hmm. and I tried to sneak an idea into it. And the idea is it's sort of like updating noblesse oblige. And the idea is, all right, there's a huge amount of, you're a smart person, you understand probabilities and statistics, and there's a huge amount of chance in life, chance of who your parents are, a huge amount of luck. So accept the idea that if you're lucky, you owe a debt to the unlucky, and that, that maybe that's the way to get there. But I, do, I completely agree, and it is journalistic heresy to say this, because you're not supposed to think that they're good people and bad people, you think everybody's just kind of the same and you're objective about them. But uh, I completely agree that the Wall Street problem now is partly a moral problem. It, it's partly that the people on top of the place do not feel a responsibility. And they feel more of a responsibility to making the money. And there's certain legitimate pressures. They run a company and they're responding to shareholders and so on, but they won't make the moral argument. And it, it, I think it's a, it's a big issue. Yeah, you could argue that if, you know, if you could get in a time machine and send people back to uh, a year before the subprime mortgage implosion and told uh, people on Wall Street and they preached, this is a problem, uh, I'm not gonna sell these, they would've been fired because- They would've been. Yeah. It would've been very hard to do the right thing. Because, That's right. Yeah, because they wouldn't be around to stop the problem, they'd just be fired. Right. If, you don't, if, you if you don't sell the heroin, we'll get someone else That's to sell right. the if heroin. That's right, if you're the CEO of the company, and you say, we're not gonna do this business because it's irresponsible, and your company's making all this less money than everybody ever the company, you're no longer the CEO. So the pressures, it's, it isn't just, it is the people are bad, it's that the system encourages them to behave not so well. Yeah. Uh, I think the big problem is like, I mean, there's a whole question about whether a company should be a public company. There were pressures on a, these companies, these banks, the, the betting side of the Wall Street used to not be public corporations, it was private partnerships. It was a bunch of guys who owned, if they lost the money, it was their money. It wasn't some shareholder's money. Right. And if they didn't want to make that much, if they didn't want to take risk, if they were willing to kind of coast for a while, they did it for a while. I mean, they, didn't, they, didn't, they weren't forced always to grope for ever greater returns. And that's a, that pressure is pernicious, especially in the financial sector. Yeah, it, it, there's almost an unwillingness to accept that there's cycles. There's, there's, there's growth then there's a fallow period, then there's growth again, that every system has a cycle. And I think we talked ourselves, especially late 20th century America, into this idea that, no, cycles can't exist. There must be, uh, you know. The success and failure. 15% growth right. every year, or, you've, or you're out. And the problem is that when that pressure becomes so great, you have to guarantee it. And if you have to guarantee it, it means you probably have to start fudging the numbers, you have to start gaming the system, you have to do whatever you can to do to show that we have the same growth this year that we had last year, if not a little more. Because if you have a little less, you might lose your job. Yeah, no, this pressure, this is true. This is, and these are, this is, I think you trace the problems in modern Wall Street back to the moment when all these investment banks became corporations and subjected themselves to that pressure. But um, yeah, anyway. Well, uh, did you, know, you think we we're going to sit here and be talking about this for this long? I did. Right. I actually, this, that's the that's the <laughs> that's the point. Uh, you know, one of the um, themes in your work too is uh, valuing and misvaluing, if that's even a word, uh, people. You know, people who other people don't see the value. I mean, it's obviously a big theme in Moneyball, but Blindside too. It is these th it's it's exactly, these it's like this, where does the, this poor black kid on the streets of Memphis who's illiterate, homeless, uh, eating out of garbage cans, you know, kind of the least valued member of our society or among them, is transformed into the most highly valued 17 year old in the country kind of thing. Right. What are the forces that change that? What, what would actually change to cause that, to cause that change in him? Or my Moneyball is exactly, it's about baseball players being so misvalued that you could build this juggernaut of a baseball team out of discarded parts from other people's teams. Um, and it does, this subject has interested me since I was misvalued. I mean, and I felt like when I went to work on Wall Street for a couple of years right after I got out of graduate school and I was being paid all this money to do stuff that I knew was, there was no way it was good for the world. Right. It might have been bad. It right. was like, at best, this is neutral. Um, and I, it just felt, I just felt 
totally bogus. It felt bizarre. And I, I saw how absurd the market was. It just, I just felt how absurd the marketplace was. I looked all around me. People paying, paid money not to do nothing of particular value. Yeah. Um, so it has interested me as a writer, like how, how people get valued. Because I think the market does a pretty poor job of it. Um, and Wall Street doesn't even grapple with this. It's like, it's just sort of assumed that uh, the market outcomes on Wall Street make sense. That, that like it makes sense that you have to pay a Goldman Sachs trader $10 million a year or else he'll leave. And uh, God forbid that happens. Right. Nobody's tested the proposition of the star systems. Like, what if we just said, we're going to create a bank where nobody gets paid very much. <laughs> maybe it'll be a good bank. No, may maybe it will actually be a really well-performing bank. Do we actually need these highly paid people? Are they actually worth what, what, what they're paid? Um, I mean, there are obvious absurd outcomes in our economy. It is absurd that people got rich creating financial disaster in the run-up to the subprime mortgage crisis. And at the same time, you know, teachers don't get paid anything, uh, or very little. I mean, yeah. that's just, obviously, there are obvious absurdities. And yes, the stories I've told often come back to that, the money ball on the blind side in particular. Yeah, and in, in, in money ball, it, was, it, it really does seem to come down to, it's always one person who comes along. It's the same thing in Flash Boys. One person comes along and sees things slightly differently. They see something that nobody else sees, or they see it in a different way. Right. And then, because they see it in a different way, uh, they, and they start acting on it, at first they meet incredible resistance. Yeah, and then, hostility. Hostility. Yeah, because basically they're threatening the livelihoods of everybody in the industry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and the, the curious thing is how slow seemingly really competitive environments are to react to someone who, got, who has a good new idea. You'd think, kind of like in theory, if someone comes along and builds a better widget, then the whole world goes and uses the better widget and, you, and everybody, all the other widgets are put out of business. Um, but take Moneyball. I mean, when I rolled into Billy Bean's office and it was 2002, he'd been doing this. He'd been winning all sorts of baseball games with no money for five or six years. And nobody in baseball cared to know what he was doing. I mean, nobody. They just there was no curiosity about it at all. Like, how could how can he pay no these people nothing and have all these players that we don't think are very good? How can they be winning baseball games? Even the players, like the players, were he, they would use them in all kinds of peculiar ways. The first baseman had never played first base mm -hmm. before. He mm -hmm. said, he, he, even he didn't like want to know why he was playing first base. Or, what is that? What, is that is that a, just a fear? Are people threatened by it? What is it that makes someone actively not want to know? What did it, I mean, you'd think it would be the most important thing. If you're a baseball player. You would think. You would think. Yeah, you would think. So I think, with guys especially, uh, there's, a, there's a crazy fear of, of seeming ignorant, of seeming not to know something that everybody knows. In Flash Boys, you see this. Ronan, Ronan Ryan, the Irishman who he's comes. He's a great character. By the what? Way. He's yeah. like, he, he spends 15 years trying to get a job on Wall Street because he thinks these guys must know something. He gets a job on Wall Street, and after six months, he says, this whole world floats on bullshit. Nobody knows anything. Yeah. And he says, he says, when he goes around and he's explaining to people you know, how the stock market works, and they clearly don't understand how the stock market works, uh, but they pretend. He says, you know, it, that none of the, he was shocked that very, very important money managers wanted to seem like they knew something they didn't know because they were afraid to seem not, to not know it, to admit ignorance. So I think this fear of admission of ignorance is, it's, it, it's widespread. And I think that's part of the problem. Part of the problem is, I mean, people who are successful and ensconced in careers and in industries, they don't want the industry to change. It's pain when it changes. I mean, yeah. you've experienced this, right? Yeah. I mean, your industry, I mean, you just, this disruption after about the age of 24 is not welcome. Uh, it is funny, there's a time, it's, some of it's biological. I had a friend once that worked at, uh, he worked in Russia, and he worked in Russia just after, for the few years after the, the Berlin Wall came down. And I said, how's it going? And he said, Everyone, because he, he part of his job was to work with businesses to help train them in you know capitalist techniques and business techniques. And I said, "How's it going?" And he said, "Everybody under thirty-three is doing great." Right. And he said, "Everyone from like thirty-three to forty, it's tough." Right. And he said, "Everyone over forty, we just have to wait for them to die." Right. Like they grew up in the system where the Soviet 
party, gave you your cardboard belt, right. your shoes, and you, you got your check no matter what happened. Right. And they, we just, the system has to, and of course, obviously, there are exceptions to that, but there's something about us that really doesn't want any trouble after the age so of like this 40. Is, and this is true in the most fiercely intellectual uh, disciplines. So there's a great book called The Structure of Scientific Re Revolutions that talks about how, how physics evolved, has evolved and that a new idea will come into physics and all the old physicists will bat it down, even though if some young guy has an idea. And, and there's the line in that book that, that science precedes a funeral at a time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, and I think baseball precedes a funeral at a time, and Wall Street does too. I mean, I think that's absolutely true. That there's a fierce resistance to people who are established. I mean, they're they're, they're um, if someone comes along into baseball and says, uh, all these all these players are valuable, and you don't know it. Um, everybody who's in baseball and may and been making baseball decisions is by implication, has by implication made a lot of bad decisions. Mm -hmm. they, they, ha they are put in a position of having to defend all these things they did that made no sense. And that's what they do. I mean, they, they brought, it's hard to admit that you didn't know what you were doing when you put together your baseball team this way, even for the New York Mets. You know, it, 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 was, it was, so I think it's just, when some dis a disruptive entrepreneur is like inherently insulting, he's inherently saying that there's something here that's, that's wrong and I can fix it this way. And Brad Katsuyama's done it here and Billy Bean did it in Moneyball. I think in my business what's happening is it's, uh, it's the internet. The internet is, you know, this show is something I couldn't have done five, ten years ago. But the bigger implication is we used to think that, and I benefited from the system a bunch of years ago, when the idea was there are a couple of people that know how to be funny on television at night. Right. And, you know, for a long time, there was one guy. We got Johnny Carson. And right. every, occasionally we'd allow another one to be around for a bit. But the idea was that he's the only person. Well, now uh, I'm not competing against other people. The other, there's 15 now talk show hosts. Right. I'm not competing against them. I'm competing against anyone who's got a funny idea in the world right. and can get it posted. Right. Which means that's that's a revolution. That's a huge revolution. How do you feel you're doing? I think it's a st it's a struggle. Right. You know, it's a daily. It's, it's a struggle. I will come up with something that I'm really proud of, and then the next day I'll see that a 13 year old girl, huh. you know, in Cleveland, right. Right. Uh, made something that made me laugh harder. Right. And if you're honest with yourself, you, uh, you know, I want I don't want to say you welcome it because there's always a part of you that's nostalgic for I made it in. Right. Now let's shut close the, the door. Let's shut the door. Right. I mean, that'd be, I think it's a very basic human uh, I agree. idea. But it, but but then I think you're you have to grow up. You have to realize that um, things are changing, and a lot of staying young is accepting that. You got to accept that it's changing. You have to accept that it's that uh, it's changing rapidly, and you have to try and figure out what's going on and yep. what's happening. But it doesn't. Anyone who tells you it feels good is probably lying or insane, you know, there, it doesn't, you, you, it's an uncomfortable process. You know, it's funny, I, I once talked to a sociologist who said that, this was back when I was working on the new, new thing, who was saying, explaining to me that she thought the pace of technical change in America had been accelerating, she felt, and that the internet was an example of this, and that the effect on uh, family relations of, of a big technology shock like the internet was similar to the effect of immigration. That, that a middle-aged parent dealing with a child with technology doing what it's doing in America is a lot like a parent who moves with his, her, their, their children, parents who move their children from Mexico to the United States and don't speak the language. And the kid quickly picks up everything yep. and is running circles around the parents right. within about six months. Right. That they, so it's like the language, the language changes, the kid figures it out first, and the parents are stuck. And th that's... The, so the, what happens, the parents try to shut down the technology. You know, that's the, yeah. uh, they are, keep it out. Keep it out of the house, keep it out of the kids' hands. You know, uh, it's not just the language and the technology, the values are different too. So, you know, the values from their old country and versus the new country. Yep. So there's a lot of, um, I think that is true. I mean, I've, I've you know, the, 
the uh, generation gap between me and the interns that work on the show is incredible. It's been widened so much by technology. But just how they experience TV and how they experience entertainment. It's, it has nothing to do with the way that I experience so, it's, it. But you, it's funny because you had your own generation gap and it was you listened to entirely different music than your parents would have listened to. Right. The sexual, at least the overt sexual mores would have been completely different. Right. Added towards, the, to, towards the different races, completely different. I mean, in some ways, uh, on the surface anyway, you look a lot more similar to your children than your than your your parents did to you. Yes. Yeah. But in fact, it's a, it's 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 very unsettling because it's a surface appearance. That beneath it, there's this shift going on. I agree that it is. I look at my kids and I do not understand. There are things that are happening in their minds that I do not understand because of technology. Like, you know, what my daughters are doing on Instagram. I just I can. It's. Don't go look, <laughs> but it's 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 just a little weird for me. Yeah, I have uh, well, I have an eight year old who understands a whole language that I don't understand. We don't let him. He, he's not allowed to go on the internet, but he's allowed to play the game Minecraft because it's creative and it's. But he wants to write code. He, he he helps me with the computer. He's eight. Right. And he'll be like, no, 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 and he'll right. no, and he'll he'll just he'll take over. Right. So there's that, and we're in a society that increasingly values what he knows much more than they value what I know. So you see the power shift already happening. You know, it's this. You know, one of my biggest questions and fears after reading not just Flash Boys but a lot of your books, but let's just stick with Flash Boys, is does anybody understand the whole? system. I get scared sometimes, and especially after the subprime mortgage, it felt like no one could explain it. It took such a long time. The Treasury didn't understand. The, the, Fed, didn't the understand. Fed didn't understand. Nobody understood what had happened. Nobody knew where the debt was. Nobody knew how to clean this mess up. It felt very much to me. I got that. We all want to feel that the grown-ups are in charge. Right. And what's happening in Flash Boys and what's happening uh, you know, throughout the system is this scary feeling that there are these giant servers all throughout the country that are processing all this information in fractions of a millisecond and that nobody really understands how it all works. It's true. I think it's completely true. Brad Kasiyama understands a lot of it. That's what's so, one of the things that's seditious about him is he's tried to piece together a picture of it. He's presented a picture that's comprehensible to ordinary people about how the market works and it's not a very pleasant picture. But I've seen in the reaction to the book the scrambling of the head of the SEC to pretend like she knows what's going on. I mean, maybe she's learned what's going on, but she didn't know what was going on. Um, the Justice Department and the FBI and the New York Attorney General all announcing investigations. I mean, you get the feeling that essentially there were no grown-ups, right. basically. It's not, it's not that the grown-ups didn't know. It's that no one is actually, nobody has actually accepted the responsibility of understanding the system. Uh, and that's the most unsettling thing, and I, that's a theme that runs through your books. I found that unsettling about Moneyball, that people that had devoted their lives to baseball didn't fundamentally understand some of the most basic tenets of what made a, a baseball team win. Well, that they weren't, and they weren't willing to upset, they weren't willing to accept new knowledge and new information after a certain point. Yeah. That what had happened was, People knew what they knew about baseball in 1975, and all of a sudden... He's got a good-looking swing. Yeah, good-looking like, face. He's got a good-looking face. I like the way he carries himself. Yeah, it, you know? it was a lot of that. Or his batting average is high, but when that's right. actually a secondary kind of trait in a good baseball player. Right. Um, and all of a sudden, people start beavering away outside of baseball and creating new baseball knowledge about what actually makes a good baseball player, and they don't want to hear it. Um, all of a sudden, the stock market goes from being a place where there are a bunch of guys on a trading floor shouting at each other to nothing but computer servers. And the code is written by people, by people who understand how to write code, but the people who are tasked with like, being the grown-ups in the market, they don't understand what that is. They don't understand what's inside the black boxes or how they work or, or, um, or whether someone's being disadvantaged in relation to someone else. They, they, they are... Um, it's very complicated. I mean, you read it. You, you, I right? read it. So you can understand why people have been slow to kind of catch up. Understanding has been slow, of the grown-ups has been slow to catch up with the reality, but that's what's happened. This reality has shifted very fast, and the grown-ups are only kind of just starting to figure out what's going on. And you do, uh, I have a fear, a paranoid fear, after reading this book, that something could go wrong. There was that glitch in the market 
I can't remember if it was the 2000, flash crash. The flash crash in 2010, where I can't remember how long was it. A few seconds. No, it was, was like it a few uh, minutes? 24 minutes. Or... 24 minutes. Yeah. The 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 system didn't work, and uh, it scared the shit out of everybody. Yeah. But everyone just pretended. Everyone held their breath, and then it went back to working, and no one wanted to know. You know what's great great about that episode is that you're right. No one wanted. No one. Everyone wanted to just be normal, go back to normal. And it went back to normal. To normal. And the SEC, well, like a year later, produced a report explaining it that does not explain it. Right. It's really. Not, it's not true. It's yeah. not true. It's really obviously not true. So, but nobody cares. Right. And, and so, like, who, uh, so there's some, all right, look, the, the financial system is a particular problem, but in this case, I think the problem is that anybody who might get themselves in a position to be a, a regulator, a grown-up who understands the system, mm -hmm. who can prevent it from doing bad things, is paid so much more money to occupy some narrow role inside the system that there's no way they're ever going to actually execute. They're not going to police or regulate or explain or m moderate the system. The, 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 the SEC, for example, is just a revolving door. Um, you don't want to be rude about the people who go there because there are a lot of well-meaning people who go to work for the SEC who really think they're going to do God's work. And, but the pressures on those people are to basically turn a blind eye to anything really bad that's going on uh, if it's going on in like big prestigious institutions. Because they may, they well, may we'll work there. They, they may go to work there, Not yeah. just may. I mean, when Brad Katsuyama goes to explain that there's basically a a predator sitting there monitoring or, or ready to exploit every stock market order in right. the United States to the SEC. He gets a lot of gobbledygook in response. There is no clear outrage within the SEC that this is going on. He goes back to his bank on Wall Street, the Royal Bank of Canada, and they do a study. And the study asks the question, how many people from the SEC have gone to work in high frequency trading firms or in lo with lobbyists who work for high frequency trading firms over the last couple of years. And they, they stopped it like two, when they got to 250 people. Yeah. I mean, it's just, and you can't, you can't really blame them. I mean, if you work for the SEC and they pay you X and you know that if you just don't, you don't stir up too much trouble, you get paid 10 X two years from now by some bank. I mean, what are you gonna do? It, it, the, so it, right. the, the, the industry has captured the regulator because the industry is so well paid. Um, but you do wonder to, extent, to what extent is a bigger problem that like, there's no grown up in other sectors, like on Washington, in, the, in the political system. Does anybody actually understand how it all works and actually sitting there thinking about how we make this better? I don't know. Are we people, politicians just chasing their own narrow ambition? Uh, but Wall Street it does feel like it could really use like a JP Morgan like character. Someone who, yeah, he's a son of a bitch, and yeah, he probably make, he makes too much money for himself, but who feels a responsibility for the system as a whole from inside the system. And it doesn't feel like any, there's, that character exists. And has a sense of history, has a sense of, I want to stand for something yes, more than just- Yes, one day I'm going to be dead and they're going to talk about me. Right, and, and that's, the, that's what uh, you feel is lacking, is throughout our country's history, there's been, and not to sound highfalutin, but people that have had a sense of uh, we've had a lot of our greatest politicians came from wealthy families. Yeah. Theodore Roosevelt didn't didn't need this. Right. You know, uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt certainly didn't need it. John F. Kennedy, they get they get involved. Their families have a sense that we owe something back to the system. Right. And there's a there's a kind of a feeling now that you'd like it if it's having a sense of history. If there were people in Wall Street who thought, wait a minute, it would be, yeah, I'm, I'm going to have a great place in Long Island either way. Right. That's the question that you ask a lot is, what is it about people that when they have $2 billion, they really are desperate to get $3 billion? Yeah. You know, when it can't possibly make a difference in your life. And fortunately, we're starting to see some very wealthy people now say, we're giving away the bulk of our fortune to these causes because this whole idea of building up billions of dollars that will, and creating dynastic wealth is is absurd. You know, it's, that's good. it's interesting how much, just to judge from behavior, how much easier it is to give away your fortune upon your death than, yeah. it, than it is to cause 
real turmoil and trouble in your industry mm -hmm. for the sake of making of improving it. Yeah. People don't want to pick fights with it. People don't break with Wall Street inside Wall Street. There's a huge it's a it's odd because it's not clubby. I mean, it, there's no longer actually a club anymore. It's not it doesn't feel like that, but it does it feel it does feel like um, people are intensely political. They want to preserve they, they don't want to burn any of their bridges. They, they want to preserve their place in that system. Um, so reforming, making, improving, uh, shrinking the system uh, is going to cause all kinds of conflict between you and the system. Yeah. Have, we, you, have you gotten flack for shining a spotlight on, on, oh, I mean, people, on, what, on, on this issue? Understandably, when you write a book that purports to show how the stock market is rigged, the people who participate in the rigging are not pleased. Yeah. Um, and so there, uh, people have been, yeah, people have been plenty rude about me, but it doesn't much, I don't think it has much effect. I mean, I got shouted on, I get shouted at on TV. That's happened a few times. Right. People have written nasty things about the book. But um, I don't think, I think I'm enough of a, I, like I have a life apart from all this, and I can write about other things and I, that I don't think people feel like they can really get to me. Or the, the the focus of the hostility that seems to be the most uh, pernicious is is the anger and hatred f directed towards the Brad Katsuyama and the people who created this exchange. Yeah, and I think f there was you know I didn't actually think anybody was ever going to you know like try to off him or anything, but I did worry a bit about, I knew how, how disruptive what they were doing was gonna be, and I, before I wrote the book, I did worry a bit about them. Um, they, and they are in the receiving end of lots of hostility, lots of anger, and people will try to put them out of business. That, yeah. I mean, that's, that's be the, that, that's, so they're gonna bear the brunt of it. I, I sort of, I did this with Billy Bean and Moneyball too, I sort of like walked into the room, picked a fight on their behalf and left the room. I mean, yeah, I, I gotta move it's on. It's interesting. Yeah, you, know? you come in, you look at everything, and, you and, write yeah. the book, and then and then and I say, you know, you two got to fight, and then yeah. I get out. Yeah. So it's a, my role is essentially then it makes then it essentially makes, cowardly. But it makes a good book. <laughs> it makes it <laughs> a good, good book, and it makes a great movie. So, but so. It left Billy Bean and Moneyball in a fight with all of Major League Baseball for years. I mean, until the, basically until about the movie came out. Right. Uh, well, there's a rule: once you're played by Brad Pitt, you're found innocent. You know? <laughs> 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 then he was off the hook. Uh, we have a question on the internet. You ready for this? This yeah. is how it's all changing. Chuck from Facebook, if that's even his real name, asks, what do you do to get pumped up before a writing session? I listen to, the, I listen to Let It Go over and over and over. <laughs> really? <laughs> I, did, I love that. Yeah, I just freak you out. I would love that. I tell you what I do. I love that was true. It, 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 well, it was true in this case, actually. Yeah. It, what happens, what I do, it's funny he asked that question. Uh, I, I feel like I have to just shut everything out so I look at, I stare at a wall, I, all the, like, the screens and blinds are down on the windows, turn off the phones, but I, I found it's a habit, it's probably a bad habit I've gotten into, but it's, it, it goes back maybe 15 years now. I have to have, I have a music I listen to. I put, I put on headphones and I listen to the same CD. I, I, my wife will burn a CD for me. I'll give her a list of songs, I say put these on and I'll just listen to it over and over and I just don't hear it anymore. And I've been playing. I've been writing that 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 those same twenty songs for two years. It's about time to stop and move on to the new twenty songs. But I, it, the "Let It Go" was actually one That's of hilarious. The, yes. So I, I have actually, I have put it on repeat song and listened to it thirty times in a row while I write. Now and this I, helps you. It's a really, or, I'm a, you realize I'm, the, saying, I'm just saying this, I'm totally aware. There's a chapter aware. in the book that's just the lyrics to the, so, yeah, to the song. Yeah, you right. realize that <laughs> it's affecting your writing. So, so um, I'm aware it's weird, uh, but it totally, I don't hear it. it, it and it totally like just, it, I, I think I start to have a, like a Pavlovian response. Yeah. If I go to Frozen, I'm sure I'll just want to pull out my pad and start right, writing. Start but, writing right, inequalities right, in the uh, yeah, but, marketing efficiencies and right, high speed trading. Right, but, it, but I do find that listening to music, often stupid music, that, uh, that I can just tune out, uh, just like shuts out the rest of the world. It creates the impact, what it does is it creates conditions in which I know I won't be distracted. I won't hear someone banging on the door. I won't hear the mailman. I won't hear a phone ring. Whatever it is, so it just it like creates it's white noise. Do you believe in the, the there's the old 
saying or belief that writers get up in the morning and they only have, they've got two hours, they've got two and a half hours in them and then that's it? You no, know? I have, what I respond to is deadlines. So I panic. Uh, I have to create the panicky environment in which I must produce. Yeah. And then I, I've done it, I've got, I've done it so often that I actually create some cushion so that after the panic is, I have time to reflect upon what I've done and go back through it and fix it and all the rest. But I find that if I have a deadline, I can write any time. Yep. It is true that the best times I find to write, write in the morning and late at night. But when you have a little kids, you can't write late at night. So yeah. it's, by, the, by then you're drinking. Dread, if there isn't the dread, things don't yes, happen. Yes, that's, that's right. I, I've said that time and time again, which is. There's the, always unhappiness in creating it. Yeah. But it's a, you, it, you, once you recognize what the feeling is, you 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 can minimize the damage it causes, uh, but yeah, totally. You have to feel, you have to feel like angry that you have to do do it. Yeah, a little irritated that you. Have I to need to do good work. I need, uh, I need dread and resentment, yeah. and and in probably equal amounts. And then something good sometimes happens comes from it. And I've had people say to me, "Can't you just?" Let's have the fun part. But what about the dread and resentment part? Let's lose that. And I'll say it just, it's, yeah, yeah, you're, you, you got to wind the rubber band yes. tightly to make the propeller go. I, it's just the only way it works. I totally agree. Totally agree. Um, we could. I could keep you here for, for six hours, but I won't. Uh, it, there's so much fascinating stuff to talk about. I uh, love the book, Flash Boys. And in, uh, I think so many people have bought it. But if you haven't bought it, go buy it. Who, who does the book on tape? Is, this, is, this, is, there, is there a book on tape yeah, yet? There's a book on tape. Who's, who's narrating it? I can't say. Oh, you can't say? No. So it, it's not going to be me? No, it won't, it won't be you. <laughs> <laughs> because because yeah. the parts of it you don't understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it would be hard. <laughs> it would be hard. You'd yes. hear me stumbling. Yeah. You'd hear some soft weeping. At, uh, no, get this book, Michael Lewis. Thank, Thank you. you. This was really cool. Thank you for doing this. Thank you. That was uh, another jibber jabber. Hope you enjoyed it. And we'll see you soon teamcoco.com slash backslash I don't know I'm the wrong age dot <laughs> org we'll see you soon <laughs>